Like, why are ethnic European people so different from the other races? And as I was introducing, I'm going to do a little talk about the link between self-recognition, social equality, and the patriarchy. And I came to some disturbing insights, also very interesting insights, leaving me wondering why exactly it is that the Western women, or at least Western feminists of today, want to uh, break away from the patriarchy and they favor a matriarchal system which will actually harm them more. Uh, so I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about that later. I was wondering if... Uh, Oh, hi, I see the first viewers have joined. So I will put this uh, this live stream also on my YouTube at The Great Johannes. It's a podcast. You can also get it on uh, Google Podcasts. I think Google Podcasts, by the way, is switching to YouTube Music or something. So you have to subscribe on YouTube Music nowadays. Uh, not sure how that works out for my podcast, but you can also listen to my podcast on uh, www.jmk.info. Uh, that's my uh, Substack channel for my newsletter. Uh, I would, uh, yeah, I would send people there. So I wonder if my live streams work nowadays because I, I used to have like a good steady 50 viewers usually. Uh, hey man, how you doing? But I wonder how, uh, I wonder how, if maybe something in the algorithm has changed, it doesn't matter. So. I'm going to talk about the link between self-recognition, social equality, and the patriarchy. I, and so I wrote this out. So I'm going to read the article. It's maybe uh, 500 words or so, not too much. And then we can talk more about it. Uh, I wanted to crack the code. Why are ethnic European people so different from other races? And I started with the peculiar observation that ethnic European children born and raised in Western societies can almost all recognize themselves in the mirror by age 12 to 18 months. Whereas, for example, African children from Kenya or Cameroon barely seem to be able to do so by age five. And no, exposure to mirrors or reflective surfaces does not play a role. Science ruled that out. So there has to be some other socioeconomic, cultural, or racial reason why black children tend not to be able to recognize themselves in the mirror until age five, whereas white children can do so before age uh, 18 months. That's weird. And so we also are going to look at um, different species of mammals that can or cannot recognize themselves in the mirror. Only less of 4% of these African children from Kenya or Cameroon were able to recognize themselves in the mirror by age 18 months. Uh, and why is it so? So I suspected that there is a spectrum that people live on culturally, ranging from highly social cultures, such as those of chimpanzees, dolphins, and ethnic European humans, to cultures that tend to isolate or discard lower ranking males. A practice found among the gorillas, for example, lions, horses, and many African, Asian, and Amerindian cultures, namely cultures that favor one or more dominant males to lead their group but who therefore treat other males as socially inferior if you watch some documentaries about horses you're going to find out that uh, horses have an alpha male or an alpha couple alpha female as well and the beta males are kept uh separate from the females they trail the females right uh but they're not not supposed to live with the females the females are basically the property of the one or two alpha males out there same with lions. You know that you've seen the Lion King movie. What happens to Simba? He's discarded. Lion cubs, when they become two years old or so, the males are discarded. Lion prides are basically prides of related uh, female lionesses, right? And uh, they discard their uh, teenage males, basically, to prevent inbreeding, of course. But um, the gorillas also do so. Uh, 25 percent or more of gorilla males live a solitary life they are not allowed to go near the females or live with any group they have to always fight and struggle to uh, become the leader of their troop or the leader of their pride or the leader of their pack and so on and so forth 
it's funny how though in our languages we have different words like troop packs and groups and, and so on for different kinds of species so it's a bit confusing to figure out which one of them is the right one uh so what i'm trying to get at here is imagine a spectrum of cultures one kind of culture where males are accepted into the group of the females and they live as relative equals to one another even though they may have a hierarchy to soothe aggression right but then on the other end of the spectrum we have uh species groups and cultures that discard their males and this is exactly what you see, for example, among the Cameroonian and so people. There's a documentary about it where you have one big alpha male and you have like dozens of men who aren't allowed to go near the society. They're treated as dirt. But these are your own people. Ah, so do you see now that the cultures that treat males as somewhat relative equals, right? They treat their own people as equals, right? Whereas the cultures that discard their males clearly do not have a concept of equality. So, uh, and you find this practice of discarding lower ranking males among many African, Asian, Amerindian cultures, but not so much in Europe. Uh, namely cultures that favor uh, one or more dominant males who treat but treat other males as socially inferior. So I began researching this problem by starting with the following hypotheses. One, self-recognition is actually the basis for social equality. Meaning, if you cannot recognize yourself in the mirror, you are equally unlikely to recognize another member of your group as an equal. Think of cats and dogs trying to attack their mirror images. They perceive their mirror image as a separate being and as socially inferior. Uh, bears also do this. They attack the mirror. Western or rather ethnic European children do so well on the mirror self-recognition test because in their culture, European culture, males also regard other male members of their own group as their relative equals, even if unrelated. Whereas males of other races, the Arabs, the Muslims, the Africans, and so on, tend to treat unfamiliar men as socially inferior, like the cats and dogs attacking their own mirror images. In fact, there is a saying in India that goes, the tears of strangers are just water suggesting that they don't feel obligated to help other people they're not related to. They will only help family members. In fact, that is a, a very big difference between European cultures and all cultures elsewhere in the world. Europeans invented equality. We started treating each other equally and then by extension the rest of the world as well. Equality is distinctly European value. Whereas other cultures don't do that. They have no concept of equality because they actually all look down on lower ranking males. Um, it's not that they have steeper hierarchies. It's that they do not consider lower ranking males to be even human at all. And so those societies never produced the values of equality and democracy, but we did in Europe and in the USA later. And three, third hypothesis is that patriarchal societies produce greater equality precisely because they allow men to cooperate in more equalized social settings, even if it is in a hierarchy where the lowest soldier is still considered human. Uh, whereas in matriarchal societies, in which females prefer one or two large dominant males, the lesser males are considered socially inferior and therefore matriarchal societies produce less equality because they have to discard the unwanted males. Uh, if you just joined listening, I'm uh, reading a short article that I wrote and then, uh, I, gonna, then I will uh, uh, probably uh, focus more on your comments. So a quick review of the known facts, verify my hypotheses. Indeed, Western children, meaning children born and raised in the patriarchal social settings of the West, are quickest to recognize themselves in the mirror, whereas children from matriarchal or matrilocal societies are slowest to do so. Because they discard their lower ranking males, the men among each other have no sense of equality. You're either the boss or the alpha or you're nothing. All right. Uh, such as the children from Kenya and those among the Cameroonian and so people. 
So according to Wikipedia's list of matrilineal or matrilocal societies, indeed, we find matriarchal types of societies predominantly among Africans, Asians, and Native Americans, but almost none among modern Europeans, with the exception of the Basque people, who were a pre-Proto-Indo-European people. And some say also rural Danish people, but other than that, no one. So Europe is, and always has been, or has been for a long time, for at least 5,000 years, a very patriarchal culture, or many different cultures, of course. Whereas you find matriarchy mostly in the rest of the world. That's interesting. And according to research on the mirror self-recognition test, indeed, mammalian cultures that tend to discard their unwanted males, such as, customary, such as is customary among the gorillas, lions, bears, and so on, Polar bear males are totally solitary, for example. They failed the test. Whereas more social groups of mammals that allow male, males opportunities to coexist with the females, such as among the chimpanzees, bonobos, and orangutans, they did pass the test and they do recognize themselves in the mirror and they happen to be more patriarchal. Okay, there's a question about the bonobos. So, uh, I made a note about that. So note that Western gorillas tend to fail the test, except those who lived among humans in zoos. What humans? Well, among Western scientists from patriarchal societies who treated these gorillas as an equal. These gorillas tended to do better, the ones in captivity, tended to do better on the mirror test, and some even succeeded in recognizing themselves. Uh, so there's a cultural aspect here. I'm not denying it. I'm not saying it's all genetics. So all also note that among the bonobos, who are considered matriarchal in the literature, however, uh, although they are called matriarchal, their leaders are still males. It's just that the males are selected by uh, the mothers, or grandmas choose the male leaders that lead. Um, and unlike matriarchal species, the bonobos don't seem to discard their males. They don't have that many uh, solitary males. And so in conclusion, Equality among males produces patriarchal societies because it increases male cooperation in the form of established hierarchies that also soothe the aggression among males. It allows larger groups of males to live together and to cooperate and work together right, uh, without having to discard 80% uh, or 90% of the males as unfit. So matriarchal societies, however, those are societies where the women favor a dominant alpha male, but they must discard all the other males that, and treat those men as lesser, and therefore these societies have no concept of equality. And thus, and thus it creates a two-tiered society that forces males to fight all, all other males. Do you know something about the dissing culture among African Americans, for example? They diss each other. They have their rap battles where they diss their, each other. It's always very negative. And these conversations, these negative conversations, they go on and on and on and on and on until either one shoots the other and, and, and right, and then one becomes a hero and the other is dead. The dissing culture, always putting other people down all the time. This is not how most white men communicate with other men. We communicate more on a kind of an equal level. Not always. There is, of course, a hierarchy and struggle and battle but we do consider each other human beings, right? We do not really, I wouldn't wanna, I wouldn't, would you talk to your neighbor, if your neighbor's friendly, would your instant reaction be to put him down verbally for no reason? No, but I think, I get the feeling that African Americans, especially the ones in their rap culture, they do exactly that. If someone, they meet a friendly person, but they put him down anyway, because, you know, I'm the boss and you the shit, you know? You know that negative culture is an aspect of matriarchal societies. And therefore, it is bizarre that Western feminist women now say they wish to deconstruct the patriarchy, while somehow also desiring equality. But this is impossible. Patriarchies produce equality by allowing men to cooperate in hierarchies, right? To soothe the aggression among the males, right? It is the matriarchal society that discards the males right, prefers only the alpha, right, and as a result of that, those matriarchal societies, uh, you know, have no equality, and they cannot, the, if the males cannot cooperate, because the struggle among the males is so great that they cannot cooperate, no wonder 
African societies and Asian societies and Amerindian societies were so far behind what we were doing in Europe. Why Europe excelled technologically and culturally in terms of architecture and music, the orchestral music, for example, and, and in trade and, and expansion and exploration, because we had the culture where men were able to cooperate with one another, because we had a patriarchy. Right? Equality produces patriarchies, and patriarchies socialize men to treat others more equally so that you can have that higher level cooperation which is necessary for a high civilization. It's why we, after all, invented the modern world. Whereas matriarchal societies tend to treat men, uh, tend to treat men, uh, where, no, teach men to treat others as inferiors uh, and basically to fight at all costs to win the position of dominant male, but then you have also a stunted society that cannot progress and develop technologically or culturally anymore, right? All right, so this was my little um, talk about the link between self-recognition, social equality, and the patriarchy, right? And so I come to the conclusion then that uh, patriarchies are best if it is your game if it is your goal to get men to work together on all sorts of uh, uh, big projects like a civilization. And in matriarchies, basically by definition, you will, ha uh, you will not be able to, uh, to achieve much. Uh, because in a matriarchy, the majority of the males are considered inferior, socially inferior, and they cannot cooperate. Well, no wonder, that's what we saw when, we were, when Europeans on their big sailboats arrive to Africa. That's how we found them, right? All right. All right, let's see if I can uh, go through some of your uh, comments here and there now. I just wanted to do my little uh, little podcast episode over here. I'm going to post this to my website, uh, www.jmk.info. You'll see it on my social media also. Uh, at Johannes MKX on Twitter X or at Johannes MK on uh, Telegram. So uh, maybe I'll put them on screen for a moment. Telegram, um, Twitter X. I get banned all the time. That's why my usernames are always different. And YouTube is, uh, I used to have more streamlined usernames across these platforms but it, it was uh you know i got kicked i got booted booted all right all right i'm gonna go over your comments to see if there's some uh something i want to respond to you know right right of course the way people build cultures can be attributed to genetics as well yeah definitely uh, I'd say that the patriarchal nature of the Europeans is baked into us by now. And yeah, how, whichever way it started, maybe we were always like this. May, or maybe this is the reason why we left Africa, if you believe in the out of Africa theory. I don't. But it's something like something to do with this. Yeah, I imagine that when our ancestors became pastoralists in the steppes of Eurasia, uh, you see, which cows do you keep for milking? Well, the females. The female cattle are the ones you can keep alive to milk them. The male cattle, they are butchered and eaten, see? Your hamburgers are made of calves, of the male calves. Uh, and your milk comes from the females. So we became basically a, a race of people, a pastoralist race, that started to dominate you know, the female cattle. And maybe that's where our patriarchal culture evolved. At least that's how I think, you know? All right, some people are speaking in uh, all sorts of languages. White majority is restricting is the future. All right. What do you think about declining populations in uh, developed countries? Uh, yeah, we were, well, you have a concept of overshoot. In, what is the carrying capacity of Europe, the continent? Uh, with or without technology, it doesn't matter. I think the natural carrying capacity is going to be like something like 30, 40, 50 million people. And so it must someday revert to that level. It's, it's simply ludicrous to think that we can always use technology to have more people. How can you do this when we're already consuming nine planets or something? It means that we're going to have to reduce the human population by 80 to 90% anyway. 
so declining populations don't have to be a bad thing, though I prefer to purge the elderly a bit quicker, you know, if I had the power to do that. If the boomers of the West would die out a little quicker, we would have more room to breathe to allow new families to be born, right? But you also need to have a reason for it. As an individual, you want to live, you want to do whatever you want to do with your life. But if you look at it from the bigger picture, if you have too many people, what's, what's their purpose? What are they supposed to do? The lack of purpose in big cities, corporate life, right? Office work is so extreme. That's why people do drugs. Uh, someone, uh, someone told a story. They uh, spent 10 years of their life from age 20 to 30 sitting at a desk behind the same computer for 10 years. Doing, and then on the weekends, they started doing drugs and drink, going drunk on alcohol and so on. And of course, so many people do that because it's not really it's not really healthy to sit behind a computer every day from Monday to Friday, 40 hours a week. You know, it's unhealthy. <laughs> it drives people nuts, especially if you have a more of a nomadically inclined nature. You want to wander, you want to walk and hike through nature. You're fit, you're physically healthy. You want to see the world rather than sit still. Why do babies cry when you put them down, but they stop crying when you pick them up and you move them around a little bit? Because people naturally like to be moving, right? And this goes for adults as well. We like to be moving, especially taking a walk is such a powerful thing to do because you're in charge of it. You're in charge of where, you, where you're going and what you're going to do, right? Your boss hopefully is not there to tell you where to walk, right? And I suppose you can use Google Maps, but you should, shouldn't. For a walk, you shouldn't use Google Maps, right? You go for a little walk, right? Uh, and that's... Uh, that's what's making people insane. That's why I think we have this drug epidemic in the Western world. You know, we have so many, uh, so many people who, who are, I call it stationary humans, parked humans, parked behind their computers at their desks for work. You're not using your body. You're only using your mind rationally, right, to solve problems on your screen if you're an accountant or something or whatever, a lawyer. But you're not using your body to move around. That's why we go to the movies to watch action heroes. Because action heroes, they get to move around and jump from building to building, right? And, and sports is just a poor substitute for what we really want. It's the hunt, you know? All right, all right. I see a lot of people commenting here, right? Oh, someone's drinking chocolate milk. Yeah, the chocolate milk supremacy area. We can digest it, right? Uh, European Union is not going to put a stop to uh, mass migration ever. They are just completely insane. I had read a report from 2008 where they projected that Europe should absorb up to 3 billion people. Uh, basically, their intention is to make white people like a less than 5% minority in Europe to drive us to extinction, really. That actually, that fact that I read in that report got me to write my book Behold the Wanderer, a novel against modernity. I wrote a book about the uh, uh, main character, some guy uh, gets arrested for hate speech, right? And goes to jail, blah, blah. And then he escapes the city eventually and he joins uh, some outfit called the, uh, what, 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 I don't know what they call them, the losers or something, the misfits, whatever. And they are basically living off the grid, the last group of humans able to do so. And they um, ma uh, they amass a small army and they start attacking the pipelines. This was before, way before uh, uh, the Nord Stream pipeline was blown up. I wrote a book about <laughs> people blowing up pipelines uh, to cut off the European the Europe, the Europolis with 800 billion people living in there uh, and to cut them off from the energy and basically to starve them all. So yeah, my book is about some... Uh, mass mass genocide because all those people living in those you know residential towers and so on their apartments and so on they have no life anyway would they really miss it if they hadn't if they were gone no, probably not right so that's how i think about this you know that's why i uh, you know as a writer you can allow yourself to explore genocidal fantasies right you can't do that in the real world right yeah. it's the perk of being a writer all right, let's see. Uh, so what will we do with the many illegals that already exist in Europe? Uh, 
they're moving mostly to the big cities. And now, of course, they want to spread them out into the smaller towns and then perhaps even the rural areas as well to take over the farms, right? But then again, we have an option to cut loose from all of this. I always mention this. There, I made a video about it called Strategic Relocation. It's about colonizing the sub-Arctic region of uh, Alaska, Canada, inland of Greenland, uh, middle to northern Scandinavia, and of course, northern Eurasia, which is mostly Russia, uh, but also, and perhaps also to some extent, uh, southern Argentina and Antarctica, but it's mostly the sub-Arctic region in the northern hemisphere, where if the temperatures would rise by one or two degrees, as the climate alarmists always say, that would actually open up vast, vast territories of farmland and pastures for cattle. Uh, the size of five times Europe. So this is opportunities. I always like to think in terms of optimistic opportunities. And, you know, uh, we could start slowly now this century, start moving more and more people out off the grid into small towns like Orania in South Africa, but then for, but then in the north where it's colder, of course, right? And we start building new towns in, in those remoter areas people will have to accept less uh, technology. Although with Starlink, they can have internet, right? So with Starlink, they'll have internet. They just need to generate electricity. So a temporary fix would be solar panels. I don't believe in solar panels. I don't believe it will save humanity. But for local outposts of our, of our peoples, sorry, local outposts of our peoples, they can use you know, solar panels for the next 20 years or so to get themselves hooked online so they can stay connected and be able to make some money working for what I think is basically a dying civilization, uh, a dying world. But we can we can sep start separa separating ourselves, segregating voluntarily from the diverse utopia of the you know, urban industrial mess that we've created in Western Europe and uh, North America as well. The big cities are just horrible, horrible places really. Um, we need to get out of there, but not everybody will be able to do it. The elderly people, they will have to stay behind. We're not going to take the old people, right? Uh, the boomers, they have to stay. Uh, and then what you want is you want to transplant your healthier stock to a new, toward a new future. And more and more people are already doing this anyway. It's not like you have to convince people. You know those people doing van life? You know those, doing, those people already building law cabins in Alaska or something off the grid? And people doing guerrilla grazing, they have like goats, they have goats in, in cities, in the suburbs, and they, the, the, the goats, they use the goats to graze off of people's lawns. So instead of having a lawnmower, they ask people, hey, would you mind my goats, my goats cutting down your grass, your lawn? And, and it, it works for some people. There's a guy on TikTok who's been traveling with three horses through the uninhabited territories of northern USA. Uh, for 12 years already. He's, he's been living a completely nomadic life for 12 years. Of course, not that many people could do that, right? Because you need a lot more space for this kind of lifestyle. But that's exactly my point. Please, 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 let us move all the Indians, all these Africans, let us move them to London and, and Paris and New York City. And then we cut the electricity, we cut the water, we cut the bridges, we blow up the bridges and so on, be done with them, right? And we, in the meantime, we're moving the fuck out. You know, that's how I see it, you know. All right, I'm going to have a little drink. Ship them to Israel, that's also a good idea. Always a good idea. We just need to get over the political correctness and just start doing what, what we want to do. Right, right, right. Yeah, right. It doesn't matter if it takes 20 years. Yeah. So do you think the migrants in Europe is a small compensation for our privileged life based on our resources? No, we don't have a privileged life. That's a strange assumption. The, the people who build civilizations are not privileged. They are burdened. We carry the burden of civilization, but we're not going to carry it any longer for people who are so ungrateful. Yeah. Save Europe by making it communist. No, come on. <laughs> Regenerative farming. No, I don't know about it yet, but I will have a look at it. Regenerative farmers. I'm regenerative. 
I myself am thinking of building with wood and doing pastoralism in the northern hemisphere, right? Uh, but others may also do grain grain based farming, but that's a little bit further south. It depends on the climate, you know. All right, regenerative agriculture use a variety of sustainable techniques. All right, for example, recycling farm waste. Yeah, well, that's only logical. Of course, we will recycle farm waste. You know, I was thinking recently, like, why do we flush our shit out to sea? As if the dolphins can eat that? No, <laughs> our shit belongs in the forest. We should actually be dumping our our the shit from our sewers in the forest so that the forest can grow. No, we're dumping it in the sea where where the whales and the, and, and the dolphins have to swim through our shit. Man, that doesn't. <laughs> if you think about it, it's weird that we flush it out to sea. It doesn't make any sense. But okay, let's let's switch to a better topic. I don't want to talk about shit all the time. Uh, have you looked into Return to the Land? All right, I'm going to look at that now. Return to the land.org. Because I always say, return the people to the land and the land to the people, right? So we can live off the grid. All right, return to the land private membership <laughs> association. Where are they? Where is this? Ozark. Oh, in Ozark. Okay. Yeah, I've heard of this. Where they're going to do uh, off the grid stuff, like Orania, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. But we need a thousand of these, not one. And we should have, we should, we should use the internet. We're not neo luddites. Like it's not like we're going to shun all technology. The way I see it, we use the technology that we still have access to to set ourselves up for the future, where those technologies may no longer be available. So that's how to do it. Yeah, I, I definitely support this Orania stuff, but it depends on the owners. I believe that there's like uh, some billionaire guy who invested in Orania and he's not really a good person. So you always have to deal with that as well. All right, the solution to mass migration is simple. If they leave, they can live. All right, All right, I get your point, yeah. But they can effectively, you know, go extinct as the cities collapse i call it the uh the urban industrial complex is not going to last forever it's going to collapse some point and maybe we can expedite it political correctness yeah it's a mind virus it's very strange yeah it, because they're afraid you know you have you have these rich people that i call them the elite but it's basically financial people with big financial interests who want this system to keep on going they want to keep growing their wealth. They don't want this to collapse yet because they can't make money off of the collapse yet, of the destruction of this nonsense yet. But it's it's not going to be maintained anyway for the same reason that the Roman Empire collapsed, ancient Greece collapsed, Persia collapsed, Babylon collapsed. They all collapsed for the same reasons. Right. Return to the land isn't Luddite. Exactly. We can use technology. For, yeah. We, like I said, we use technology toward uh, setting ourselves up for the future. Right? Because you also have like the Mennonites and the Amish people who do, who do seem to shun technology and they they still do well. But we don't have to be like that. We can use technology to accelerate uh, what we're going to do to get out of the big cities. Right. And you know, have our culture again, have live as who we really want to be and not have to spend half our lives working just to pay rent. You know, there's a woman on TikTok. She's a Dutch woman. She spoke about why she went off, off why she's cho why she chose van life. She built a little, little van to live in. She chose it because uh, she was living uh, at a very low cost housing and then they were going to tear that down to put new houses on there for sale that she could not afford. And she was offered to to rent an apartment for a thousand euros a month, which she could not afford because that was going to be uh, more than half of her her income. You know, and then she decided to go live in a van because in a van you can park it somewhere, especially in southern Europe. There are so many places where you can park um, for free. And then you only pay your insurances and your food and water basically and water is usually also free right uh so that's so uh, that's why you see a lot of i see more and more dutch people doing this the dutch people are supposed to be so rich they're going off the grid because they just don't want to live 
in these cramped quarters with that stupid office work, doing the same work for a decade in a row, never really progressing anyway, always making the people above you richer, right? You know? Right, Europeans created technology. It's ours to use it for our people. Exactly, that's what technology is for, you, right? Europeans made one mistake throughout history. We've always been selling our technology to uh, other people. So we sold our weapons technology to the Turkish people for 500 years now. And we st we're still doing that. Like, like Obama sold uh, all, all the... Uh, all the military equipment that the U.S. military no longer needed, they sold it to the to the Arabs and the Saudis. It, this is <laughs> people. Come on, we should be a little smarter than this and not sell our best technology to our enemies, right? Or potential enemies. This is a bit absurd. All right. Uh, I think raw milk is supposed to be the best because it contains better uh, uh, better nutrients, but also. Uh, these microorganisms that keep you healthy, right? So I also drink about a liter of milk a day, but I don't have access to raw milk here, but I would like to, yeah. If I can find raw milk, I just drink raw milk. They say it's supposed to be a problem, but I, I don't believe that. Yeah, you disagree with completely abandoning progress, right? Right. Right, well, okay, but the Dark Ages weren't dark, by the way. That's just that was just propaganda, anyway. Europeans' downfall is we are too altruistic. Yeah, yeah. The th what allows us, I spoke about that earlier at the start of this uh, live stream. What allows Western men to cooperate is the fact that we see each other as relatively equal, even though it's in hierarchies, right? Uh, but the hierarchies help us soothe aggression and so we know our place right and of course uh, that has as a side effect that we treat outsiders as relatively equal as well and i think we europeans if we could just learn that that we should treat our own people as relatively equal but not outsiders there meaning racial outsiders should not be treated equally that's how we should do it. I mean, it's it's strange that they call white people racist when we're actually the least racist people in the entire world because we are the ones who actually treat others equally. It's the reason why, for example, the Arabs and the Africans in the past love doing business with Western white people, with Europeans, because we gave them a better deal than their own people would. So if we gave them an honest deal, like we would treat their merchants as our equals and give their merchants a fair cut, a fair price. Whereas Africans amongst each other would not do that. They do not offer each other a fair price. Go to Nigeria and see how they do business negotiations. It's just sheer aggression trying to stomp on the other person, trying to uh, belittle them. And usually it's the physically bigger guy who gets the win. But we don't do that in the West. In the Western world, a small guy and a big guy can do a fair kind of relatively fair deal you don't see that in the muslim world in the muslim world it's basically you know the biggest guy gets the biggest cut and and this is you know if you think about it that is extremely destructive for the sense of cooperation between males and without that cooperation between males there's no progress no technology no future no civilization no fucking orchestra to play your music music you know All right, I can get a bit passionate about this topic. I, so this may sound strange, but I do favor the concept of equality among our own people, though. Equality means you treat everybody as a human being, but there's going to be a social hierarchy. I, that I, I consider hierarchy to be still relatively equal because the alternative is to discard all the unwanted males. Uh, then you have no hierarchy. You have no organization. We Western people... Our, when, we, when we speak of the white supremacy, what should it really mean? What should white supremacy really refer to? It should refer to the fact that we are able to have large groups of males cooperate with each other without constantly fighting each other, right? Whereas others could not do that for a long time, you know? Although the Asians, the East Asians, they're doing it fine now, right? But imagine it this way. In Western Europe, we have traffic rules. In the Western world, we have traffic rules and we abide by the traffic rules. Everybody knows the rules. Right? You have to get a driving license so you know the rules. But then look at how they do it in India. <laughs> it's just first come, first crash or something, you know? <laughs> I mean, 
if you transplant that Indian attitude there, the way they have their traffic, you transplant that to Canada, boom, Canada is a third world country. And I think, I think soon, in five years time, not 10, not 20, but five years time from now, Canada is going to be a third world country, just like India. They'll never succeed in advancing beyond their own limitations because primarily they're not even aware or don't even want to discuss their own limitations, right? That's so bizarre about Indian people. Like, how come after all this time they have never been able to implement proper fucking traffic rules, right? Why don't they do that? Oh, it's not necessary, blah, blah, blah. Really, look what happened in Canada. Some, in, some guy from India crashed into 15 white people, killing them with his truck, you know? Yeah, yeah, we need the fucking traffic rules. It's part of our, what we call, you know, civilization. Imagine traffic rules based on who has the biggest car or who has the biggest biceps. So instead of watching your traffic light going from red to green, you have to flash your bicep. And if you have a bigger bicep, then you have right of way. And the other guy has to pause it. Imagine if it were like that. Yeah. Yeah, that's how it is in some places in the world. You know, it's just fucking stupid. Yeah, I do like classical music because I... Uh, I have a small talent of you know, dreaming up some melodies sometimes, you know, and I, I like to express that. Yeah. So by the way, if you're <laughs> now that you're here, I have a Kickstarter project called uh, Symphonic Poems of Valhalla. Uh, maybe I can post a link here. I do a little self promotion there uh, because uh, it's, it's got like five days left. I've got five. No, how was it? Five days ago, I got four backers. <laughs> I was going to do a whole CD uh, here. I don't know if this works. Oh, I wasn't allowed to post a comment. Okay. F fucking you. No. Oh, here we go. Maybe this helps. Anyway, uh, I was trying to do the Kickstarter, but I don't know how to do it because Kickstarter itself does nothing for you. Absolutely nothing. You have to constantly promote it yourself. So I put it in my newsletter. I put it in my uh, my live streams, but then, you know, so if you if you happen to be a very wealthy person and you can spare some money, then you can get me to uh, get me to uh, produce sixty minutes of uh, classical music, symphonic poems for the full orchestra. Yeah. I already produced a few, of course, and you can listen to those on my uh, on YouTube, for example. Yeah. I put some uh, updates on the Kickstarter. So either way, oh, you're a classical violinist. Okay, that's very interesting. Yeah. So I'm just somebody who knows how to come up with melodies and then I work with the computer to get it to get it to sound right. So <laughs> it's not like I'm the expert. I tried studying uh, uh, orchestration by Adler. Simon Adler wrote a book on the orchestration. I, I think it's the uh, the study book. Uh, yeah, there's so much to learn. But then again, creative people don't do that. Creative people don't first study the book and then, no. Creative people, they simply start making the music and if it sounds right, it's it's all right, you know. Oh, you're speaking Slovenian, okay. Would ne I would never have guessed. I would. Have, I, would I know it's it looks Eastern European, but I would never, maybe I, would, I could be Czechoslovakian or Polish, right? Interesting, yeah. If you uh, if you are from Slovenia, do you know Daria from Slovenia? Daria is a woman on TikTok who also does. Uh, she speaks about some right wing topics as well. She's a very very kind person, very spiritual. All right, all right. <laughs> is that? Oh, yeah. That's an interesting connection. Maybe that's because of the uh, the Indian traffic mess is why they've been promoting AI cars because migrants are never going to be able to drive properly. Maybe maybe that's the reason. Yeah? That's horrible. If you think about it, you know. That you know, well, you see you see how this is going to end, right? If we in the West have to develop so much technology to deal with lower IQ immigrants, that we cannot make smarter through education because that doesn't work, right? At some point, you have so many stupid people 
and the technology required to deal with them is so complicated. You have such a stack. You, have, you know what the LAMP stack is, like Linux, Apache, MySQL, and PHP. And then we have such a stack of software and technology upon, atop each other, basically. This, this is the new Tower of Babel, now that I think of it. The new Tower of Babel is our technology stack. And if any piece along the way breaks away, like a Jenga tower or something, the whole damn thing will collapse. It will, it will. If we need this much technology to deal with people who are so low IQ, wouldn't you be better off with smaller peoples but with higher IQs and not have to rely on technology so much to have a sensible organization? Yeah, see? So that's what it is, yeah. All right. All right. Are Sumerians from Caucasus? I don't know, man. All right. I've been having fun on the live stream. Uh, <clears throat> usually I try to fill an hour and I've done 45 minutes now. By the way, I will put this on my YouTube channel at the Great Johannes, right? So uh, you can find it there later, do the replay if you wanna watch the whole thing again. Right. Slovenia was swimming in debt under Tito. Okay. Let's see if I can find something to talk to, to you about. So I'll go to Zero Hedge. <clears throat> Hold on. All right. <clears throat> Uh, the Trump hysteria again, yeah. I watched the whole Trump thing in 2016. It was a very interesting experience, but I'm not going to do that again. They're flooding the U.S. with fentanyl. You know what I think when I hear that? Flooding the U.S. with fentanyl is like flooding China with opium. Uh, turns out most of the fentanyl producers are in rural China today. And I feel as though this is actually the Chinese revenge for the opium wars. So maybe I need to explain this. The, the British Empire, they got Chinese people addicted to opium so that the Chinese ad addicts were then forced to sell their gold and their s resources at low prices to the British, right? And I think, therefore, that China now is secretly behind the fentanyl crisis in the USA to try to get Americans so addicted that they're basically going to destroy themselves or, or make cities uninhabitable right so people will always say that nah, you're wrong you're just making stuff up are you on the spectrum you know but that's how this works the the top leadership of china they know the history xi jinping the uh, the president of china he has said that he personally wanted revenge for the uh, what they call the the century of loss the lost century is from the year 1850 to 1950 china lost all wars it had with the western powers a uh, hundred years of humiliation and xi jinping personally said that he wants revenge for that so what do you think that means uh, well he's going to support russia to go to war with europe he's going to support iran and the turks to go to war with europe he's going to support the west africans to go to war with france and europe <laughs> If Xi Jinping could get the Americans to fight Europe, he would, right? He would do it. So basically, he wants to destroy uh, the British, obviously. That's Xi Jinping's main target, I would assume. But in order to do that, he may need to destroy Europe as well. So sometimes it pays to try to see the world from the perspective of the enemy so you can realize, okay, what are they going to do next? You know, what, what are their plans? So I think China on the one hand, can be a wonderful trade partner for Europe. Uh, on the other hand, China is seeking to use the money they make from trade to buy Europe. That's what they really want. I think they want to own Europe and then cut the British, the Anglo-Americans out of the European market, basically. That is some 
what I think is the goal. And of course, it's up to us Europeans now to decide, do we want that? Do we want to go along with this Chinese plan of conquest for us? Or do we want to perhaps figure out some way to make ourselves independent again in a way where we may not be as wealthy as we are today, but we will be in charge. And I think that's very valuable if we could stay in charge somehow, some way. All right, so that's the fentanyl crisis. The gap between the rich and poor is larger than ever and frustration is growing to dangerous levels. Yeah, what do you think? If you keep importing the poorest people from the world, there will always be a, a growing gap between the poor and the rich in your country. You know, maybe that's the problem, huh? Uh, who is this? Yeah, here, here we have it. Some European NATO country, I think, who was it? Estonia's prime minister, a woman, of course, said that they need to break up the Russian Federation. Breaking up Russia is a plan uh, dreamed up by Zbigniew Brzezinski in the book The Grand Chessboard. Here, The Grand Chessboard. Uh, this has been the U.S. plan to topple Russia for almost 60 or 70 years now. All right? No, 50 years. 50 years or so, at least. All right? And now you hear these NATO allies in Europe echoing exactly a plan that was conceived half a century ago. It's just it's just so stupid. Yeah, it's yeah, it's a woman, of course, because you know why? Because they do not serve their people. They're just actors. So it's strange to call something misogyny when clearly these women are elected by George Soros personally, right? Maybe they don't. Maybe that's it. They don't understand the comment. When I say a woman, of course, means she's working for George Soros, for the World Economic Forum, for the Open Society Foundations. She's a puppet, right? They put puppets there because men are, of course, more independent and less easily swayed. I'm gonna block people for that, by the way. People are so fucking stupid, man. No, no, no. This this Estonian prime minister doesn't want to prove anything. She's just an actress. You have to imagine they're not real politicians anymore. They're just actors. Actors and actresses. <laughs> she says that Russia should become smaller as the desired outcome of the Ukraine war. Uh, so far, Ukraine has only been losing. Russia has been only been winning. Your dreams are not going to come true. You know, you don't manifest this kind of victory. Yeah, Georgia again. Georgia, the country borders on Russia, is another puppet state with a puppet regime installed by by the USA, by the West. It's pathetic. They want to put Georgia into the, into the EU, the European Union. It's not even connected to any EU member state. And Turkey is in between Europe and Georgia. And then what? They're going to allow Turkey to join the European Union? Turkey isn't in Europe. It's in Eurasia. It's Central Asia. Come on. The European Union is, of course, a stupid imperial project like the Roman Empire. They try, they try to play Roman Empire, but of course, they're completely stupid. The European Union should not exist, in my view. <laughs> European Union says that ChatGPT outputs too much false information to comply with its disinformation rules. Can you believe that? OpenAI, ChatGPT, is like a liberal woman journalist working for the New York Times. And it's not compliant with the rules. <laughs> come, come on. Yeah, we need a Germanic union. Uh, absolutely. I mean, we have so many of these unions. We have also like the Visegrad unity in Europe, right? Uh, everybody has their own unions. Why don't we have a Germanic union? We should. And then stand together on our own interests, you know. 
What do you think about Rishi Sunak bringing back conscription, conscription if the Tories win? Yeah, well, go ahead and die for your replacements. Fight for your replacements, you know? I was imagining the movie Braveheart. I don't know. Maybe I'm too old for the reference. If you still know what Braveheart was about, uh, you know, they may take our women, they may take our lands, but they'll never take our cowardice. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Holy Roman Empire. That would be a Germanic Union, sort of. If we could do that, the Holy Roman Empire plus Scandinavia incorporated. Yeah, that would be our what we want, right? <clears throat> I think AFD is largely controlled opposition, but still it's the best they've got. At least they can talk about certain topics now, you know? Uh -huh. Yeah, white Americans are very Germanic. Yeah, of course, yeah. But we need a union in Europe, of course, right? Uh, your, the American leadership does not support us. Uh, Braveheart is classic, yeah. All right. Do you think Israel will use nuclear weapons if world war, if the world order turns on them even more drastic? No, no, no. Um, yeah, you won't believe me, but I think nuclear weapons aren't real. So you can't use them. That's why the whole war in Ukraine was a conventional war. Why didn't they use nukes? You know, they can't use nukes because they're not real. It's just psychological warfare, basically, to manipulate the, uh, the civilians. Right, right. So yeah, the USA, yeah, of course, if you can hold on to it, but you've already lost the big cities. And in Europe, we're losing the big cities. And then the question is, should we even care to maintain the cities at all? Why don't we just somehow f cut loose from that? All right. All right, I'm going to say goodbye to you because I've been speaking for almost an hour. And then uh, I'm going to put this video on my YouTube channel at The Great Johannes. And you'll see it also pop up on my other social media if you're following me there. And do take a look at my Kickstarter called Symphonic Poems of Valhalla. I'll type it out one more time. Uh, you might want to support that if you can. Uh, and otherwise, I'll just see you again uh, during the week or so, right? All right.